Good day everyone, Doc Miga here, and for today we will be discussing anesthesia in large animals. I have divided this lecture into two videos, right? And uh, supplemental YouTube videos would have a big part in our lectures, so make sure that you pay attention when you see suggestions that appear in this area of the YouTube video. They will direct you into videos in YouTube that are currently demonstrating whatever I am discussing. All right, let's begin. When you think about anesthesia in small animals or what we call companion animals, as compared to large animals, you could immediately infer or imply a lot of differences between them in terms of approach, in terms of equipment needed, the amount of anesthesia that we utilize, and just the basic uh, difference of size of these animals and how much anesthesia we need to administer to be able to render them uh, um, anesthetized, right? even sedated. For, uh, for us to be able to do basic to complicated procedures, right? So um, even if they are so different, I would still need to uh, ask you to cater all your knowledge and experience in small animal anesthesia as we go about this lecture, all right? So the first thing that we have to distinguish would be the difference between general, regional, and local anesthesia. I believe you uh, learned this already in pharma, so let's just review, all right? If I give you a cattle to anesthetize and um, this cattle will, will undergo a flank laparotomy, all right? For a, a certain number of abdominal surgeries. So in, um, in, in small animals, automatic, automatically, we induce general anesthesia. Number one, it's easy. Number two, um, they're small, so you do uh, you need just um, you know a very minimal amount of anesthesia to render them unconscious, and um, and to be able to do whatever you want, right? However, in cattle or in other large animals, including small ruminants and horses, you have to consider the choices that you have. All right. Remember when we discussed surgical judgment, right? There are, there are a lot of factors that we have to consider before we go into the theater and conduct the surgery, right? This is one of them, and this is a very important factor, all right? You have a lot of choices, starting with local anesthesia. In local anesthesia, you are just rendering the exact area where you are going to... Um, make the incision uh, painless, all right? So if we are just going to induce local anesthesia, this is the only part that is anesthetized, all right? When we say anesthetized in local anesthesia, the, um, the sensation is not there, it will not react to any pain or any noxious stimuli. Now local anesthesia is good for uh, minor uh, wound management techniques, if you want to suture a laceration or an abrasion, if you wanted to explore a very superficial wound, that is good, that is great. However, it is not um, indicated for um, surgeries wherein you need to manipulate a, a bigger amount of subcutaneous and muscular tissue, all right? Because anywhere that is not infiltrated by a local anesthesia will cause the cattle to feel whatever you're doing in there. All right, that is where we do a bigger version of local anesthesia, of local anesthesia, all right? Wherein we need to desensitize a bigger part of um, the body of the animal surrounding your planned incision site. And this could be of variable depths, all right? It all depends on how deep you are infiltrating the anesthesia um, uh, inside the cattle so from superficial subcutaneous tissue to muscular tissue to the peritoneum that is still a part 
of um, local anesthesia. However, if you need to, again, render a bigger part of the animal um, to be anesthetized, all right? if you need it to be painless, if you, if you think you're going to manipulate a bigger uh, part of the body, or if you think um, you're going to do two surgeries in one day, then you might um, opt for regional anesthesia. All right. For an, for example, um, central neural blockades of um, certain spinal nerves will render everything caudal to that point, where in that line of the uh, that blue sh uh, so blue black shading starts, everything there is anesthetized, which includes the pelvic limb, which is a very important factor when you consider what will happen to an animal if its pelvic limb. Um, pelvic limbs are anesthetized and the cranial part of the body is not, all right? But there are some procedures that would require you to render the caudal part of the body of the animal to be anesthetized. However, in certain cases, we're in uh, regional or local anesthesia won't, won't work. That, that is the time wherein we do general anesthesia. We're in the whole animal is anesthetized, it is uh, knocked down, as they say, and it would be reliant on us to maintaining certain physiological function for it to survive a general anesthesia and for it to wake up, right? So the choices between general, regional, and local would be entirely up to you, number one. Uh, number two the, um, would be dependent on the surgical procedure that you are doing. Is it possible to do with just local or regional or do you need to knock down the whole patient? And you can imagine the amount of um, equipment, personnel, the risk as well, the surgical risk to the animal and the personnel increases as we go from local, regional to general. All right. So if you have um, enough personnel, enough resources from pre-op, during operation, and post-op, and the surgical procedure warrants general anesthesia, then go for it. But then again, there uh, most most uh, surgeries done in ruminants are done with just regional or local anesthesia. Horses, yes, we can do regional and local anesthesia with them as well, but quite limited. So we usually go for general for horses, all right? So whatever your choice is for um, what kind of anesthesia to induce to an animal, um, there are a lot of things that we do before, and one of them is uh, fasting. Why do we need to fast an animal before surgery? Even with us in um, um, medicine, right? When we go, when, when we undergo surgeries, we need to be fasted for a certain number of hours. Why? Why do you think? I think I could imagine you saying, Para hindi sumuha, Doc. Para, um, para hindi mag-aspirate, right? Kapag sumuha. Because, um, because the reason, uh, the underlying principle why you don't want patients to vomit, right? Even if um, some veterinarians do that, they intentionally give silazine for patients to vomit. Para walang laman yung chan. But you could actually um, prevent that by simply fasting the animal. Why do they do that? I understand it. Because a lot of uh, clients would give something to the animal because they think it's going to starve if it misses one meal at night. All right. So um, it's one way to know that your client is lying. Number one. Number two, you want to fast an animal for such reasons, all right? This is specific to large animals. Number one, you need to reduce the volume of the rumen contents, all right? Especially if you are doing a gastrointestinal surgery, you do not want your field of vision to be occluded by such a big rumen, all right? Number two, decreasing the volume of the rumen would also decrease the pressure on the diaphragm, especially if you are conducting your surgery in dorsal recumbency or lateral recumbency um, in patients which are undergoing GA, all right? 
Number three, to decrease risk of passive regurg regurgitation, which happens in all of the species during uh, general anesthesia. And this could lead uh, to aspiration pneumonia and for some bloat as well. And if you are not paying attention to your animal, your animal could be showing signs of hypoxemia and hypo hypoventilation, and it might be too late for you to actually fix that, right? That is also why I am a fan of endotracheal intubation, because that secures your airway and prevents anything from the cranial aspect of the trachea to get into the lungs, and that secures your uh, passageway of air, and that makes sure that um, nothing will be aspirated. That's why I always want um, animals to be um, intubated whenever they undergo GA, when possible, of course, especially if this is a clinic animal, right? Yung pumunta sa clinic para magpa surgery talaga. Of course, pain neuter campaigns, we can't do anything about it, but um, in cases wherein we do general anesthesia of large animals, it is much, uh, it is very beneficial for them to be intubated with that, right? So how long do we fast these animals? For horses, uh, it is uh, six to 12 hours. For water, don't withhold it. For adult cattle, um, since they have such a big rumen, the food is usually uh, withhold for, withheld, sorry, for 18 to 24 hours. Water is six to eight hours. And for the young ruminating cattle and small ruminants, Food is 12 hours, water don't withhold. Of course, the mechanism or the concept of fasting would not apply for patients needing immediate surgical correction or for those patients with emergent conditions. You go straight to surgery if need be, right? So we have been talking about GA, regional anesthesia, local anesthesia. What is sedation? Sedation is the depression of the animal's responsiveness to its environment and to any external stimulation, all right? And large animals, which tend to hurt you whenever you try to do anything to it, would benefit, and you would benefit as well as the handler, when these animals are sedated for short minor procedures wherein you need to, for example, um, collect diagnostic samples, you need to do ultrasonography, or you need to do an orthopedic exam, check the hooves, check the, um, check the ventral aspect of the animal. So this would help. And if this animal also will go into surgery later on, um, the sedation would act as the pre-medication before GA induction. All right. So the goal for uh, sedation, all right, especially standing sedation, is that the animal must remain standing, all right? So it should um, keep the function of its limbs to support itself, but it needs to be indifferent to its surroundings, which includes noise, when it is touched, when it is handled, all right? So what are the advantages of standing sedation over GA, all right? Um, there is lower risk of anesthetic-related complications, reduced costs, reduced operating time, and disadvantages would be if you over sedate, there would be severe ataxia or severe incoordination in foot placement with these animals. And that's not good because they would move uh, away and that could ruin your surgical field. Uh, number two, surgical conditions not ideal because again, um, they would still tend to move because they can remain standing. Um, there is increased injury risk to personnel and to the animal during surgery. Usually, we would need um, uh, people to handle this animal during sedation and after it during recovery. And one important thing is that sed sedatives must be given in a quiet environment for maximum effect. All right? When you give your sedatives, you have to give it time to work before you actually do your work. All right? So there is a list of sedatives which, has, which act as uh, pre-med drugs as well. And I will just give it to you and rip the band-aid off. Yeah, that's a lot. All right, that is a lot. Chill, chill. I never memorized this. You don't have to memorize this um, for my subject, 
all right? I don't know how, how it would be for when you take your licensure, but for now, don't. And let's, let's, um, let's be honest, you're not memorizing shit anyway because everything is online. You do not need to. Um, you're probably doing your exams, open notes. I know this already. So just chill, all right? I never memorized these. So um, I would want you to focus on the drug families here, how they work, what works with who, and which ones need not be mixed with others, all right? Because in large animals, you barely use just one drug. It's usually a mixture or a combination of two or three drugs for you to get the maximum effect with minimal side effects. All right, so let's discuss the first thing here, which is um, basically included in almost all of the animal species. That would be your alpha-2 adrenergic agonist, all right? Also known as alpha-2 agonists, right? They are a good sedative. It is very much used. Why? Because they also have analgesic effects. So you do not need to add an analgesia when you give these drugs right the most commonly used um alpha 2 agonist in horses would be the the thomidin this is widely used in us already this is the only approved one in large animals all right and um sorry um it is in horses sometimes it is used in uh what did i read cattle but extra labelly all right Dose is there. The onset is quite fast if given in IV, but it is also fast if given IM. And the duration would also be dependent on how on, on what dose you are giving. All right? So the other alpha-2 agonist, which you will use, I think, when we go into the laboratory, would be Silazin. All right? Silazin, very commonly used. Um, in the previous slide, the dose is there. I did not include it here because I will be focusing on the adverse effects of silazin. Right? In cattle, um, it causes reflex bradycardia. With it, hypotension. It also causes decreased gastrointestinal motility. And that is why um, horses are more affected by silazin as compared to cattle. Usually, the dose is like one-tenth of what is used in cattle. Right? And it also causes interference with the antidiuretic hormone, which leads to polyuria of the animal, um, dilute urine for at least four hours, depends on the dose that you use, uh, decrease uterine blood flow and increase uterine contractility. However, if you think, oh, decrease uterine blood flow, increase uterine contractility, then it is causing abortion. Not as much. Um, they did not, um, in their studies, it does not cause abortion, but it must be used with caution in pregnant animals. So basically, when you see used with caution, don't use it. <laughs> All right. Um, however, in sheep and goats, right, it causes hypoxemia if administered IV. All right. It could also cause um, hypoxemia if administered IM, but not as much of, as if, if it is administered intravenously, right? How so? How do silaz uh, How does silazin? I always love this question. How do things cause things, right? Um, how does silazin cause hypoxemia? Basically, actually, all uh, all anesthetics would have an effect on the ventilation of the animal. It's usually a depression of the ventilation. That's why the RR would go down. Um, there is always a risk of aspiration because they would tend to breathe deeply, but um, the rate would also be low. But why? Why would it cause hypoxemia? This is a specific uh, drug. All right, you don't need to research it anymore. Or, or maybe you do. You do. I, I actually like the fact that you answer the questions that I say to my laptop right now. Um, and then message it in the classroom. I actually like it. So, um, research on how silazin leads to hypoxemia in sheep and goats. All right. It's actually an interesting mechanism that it does. All right. So, the onset of this is quite fast again with IM. I'm uh, sorry, with IV. 
triple that with I am. And it causes sedation for one to two hours, but the analgesic effect is not as much. It's only la it only lasts 15 to 30 minutes, right? So I think uh, I approached this lecture in a way that I discussed the drugs, then I discussed the anesthe anesthesia uh, monitoring, then I discussed regional in a way. <laughs> um, because the approach so, lar so large animals is that every aspect of this is a factor of to what you decide, especially if you have everything. However, if you don't have all of these drugs and you only have psilocin, then you don't have any choice, right? Anyway, I, I just realized that because I tried to to make a a sy systematic way of teaching anesthesia when I don't know anesthesia. And I, I'm just teaching it to you the way I understood it, right? Next, phenothiazines, uh, still uh, used again in, even in small animals. The dose is right there, onset is right there, duration is right there. You need to memorize it, it's up to you guys, really, up <laughs> to you. All right, um, really good with tranquilization and with, a, with quite a fast onset as well. Oh, why did that picture appear immediately? <laughs> okay. um, one thing, well, it's good as a tranquilizer. It's good to calm a patient, especially if these patients are um, fractious or aggressive. ACE would, do, it would really be good. However, if you increase the dose, it will actually not deepen the sedation. So just be careful with how you use it. That's why the range is just 0.0 to 0.05 not that big of a range, right? However, when it is used in horses, especially male horses, it causes this very, very bad side effect, which is what we call penile prolapse. Now, this would um, this will not stay this way, right? It will, it will um, once the drug wears off, um, it will go back to its original position. However, this would indicate to you that you need to take care of that soft tissue hanging <laughs> right there um, before, um, while the drug is wearing off, all right? So again, another assignment. How do you take care of that hanging thing right there uh, while it is there, <laughs> all right? How do you take care of it? What do you do to prevent any iatrogenic trauma to it? How do you prevent any um, dirt from getting to it? All right. I, I imagine you guys Googling this. Oh my gosh. Uh, just be specific that you put horses in there because I did it too and it was so bad. That, that Google image um, result was, was led me to suddenly close my laptop just as fast as I clicked enter. All right, so uh, another thing, another thing, ACE prom would uh, cause um, the BP to go down, uh, not significantly, but go down. But that is really bad if you have hypovolemic horses who are in, they're already suffering with low BP. So if you give another uh, drug that, which causes low BP, that will just basically kill your animal. All right, next. Benzodiazepines. Um, most common would be your midazolam, your diazepam, or your benzodiazepines. These are, we're going to focus on their muscle relaxant effects, right? And they are not used alone. They're usually in combination with opioids or dissociative anesthetics. And the most commonly used dissociative anesthetic would be ketamine. Ketamine, um, back home in the Philippines, you can buy this. It is restricted, yes. You need an S2 license for this from uh, the drug and uh, whatever PIDEA is called right now. Um, so you need a license for that. And usually there's a limit of three vials per week. That's the only amount that you can buy. Right? Uh, why is it mixed with that? It increases duration of the sedation um, to 20 to 25 minutes. And it is the preferred... Uh, drug to be used for neonate ruminants and foals because uh, benzodiazepines, although they're very good muscle relaxants, they also cause, um, what do you call this? Uh, sorry, 
uh, when they are combined with the alpha-2 agonists, they would avoid the cardiovascular side effects. So midazolam, 0.05 to 0.1, mepercag, IV only, right? Um, if in combination with ketamine, the onset is a one minute, duration is one to two hours. Um, another thing, the diazepam is, uh, hmm. diazepam, midazolam cannot be administered intramuscularly. Why? Right? I have three questions now. I have four more later in one slide. Right? These are actually your group discussion questions. So I appreciate those who... Um, who post their answers. And for those na medyo nahihiya, ayaw i-post yung answer nila, baka kasi mali, you can message it to me personally. One of you did that and we had a very good conversation about it. Alright? Another sedative pre-med drug would be the opioids. Um, medyo mahirap hanapin sa Pilipinas. Again, restricted or walang supplier. And... Um, usually, ang mga available lang sa atin would be the weak opioids, but they're still available. Butorphanol, right there. Um, you again, you don't give this as as is. You 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 give it as a combination with either silazine or detomidin to improve the sedative effect and the analgesic effect of those uh, drugs. Methadone always used this when I was in Hong Kong, um, but still restricted. It's guarded by a key, <laughs> right? Because of its potency. So you just add to your existing pre-med drug 0.1 meg per kg IV. Now, where am I going to use all these numbers? Whenever I give you problems to solve, right? So you could actually go into the this um, uh, slide, uh, this PowerPoint to review on what dose I would need you to use, right? But but most of the time I I would usually just give you the dose para isa lang yung sagot natin. Now one question: When we say pre med drug, pagdating sa as ano ang usual member ng pre med drug combination mo? That would be ano usually binibigay mo before you give zolitin. Hmm? Atropine, your anticholinergic drugs. Now do you have to give it? To these animals as well, like atropine, um, glycoparalyte. They're not routinely administered as pre-med for large animals anymore. Uh, why? Also the reason why I don't use them for small animals. Um, they decrease gastrointestinal motility. They just produce tachycardia, which makes me think they're waking up. And... Yes, it has um, that effect wherein it decreases salivation, but it does not decrease the salivation enough to eliminate the aspiration risk in those patients. All right. So um, do we use this in surgery? Yes, of course, to treat uh, reflex bradycardia or whenever the patient has uh, too deep of an anesthetic depth and you want to fix it. Yes, you could give atropine. All right. Now, let us go into general anesthesia. General anesthesia is usually induced with intravenous anesthetics uh, uh, applicable for the small animals and large animals, except for pigs, wherein we just give everything I am, All right? Um, honestly, I don't know why. Um, number one, I think veins would be hard to find in, in the pig. Again, they're very stressed whenever you just uh, try to hold them. So you want to minimize that. So usually derecho again I am. But again, if you can find uh, another reason why it is I am for pigs, because in the book that I read, in three of them actually, um, it just says I am is preferred, right? Or if you know someone who is a swine practitioner, please um, graciously ask them the question as to why. All right now um, that is induction the maintenance can be done through again what we usually do incremental iv boluses of the induction agents for short duration surgeries pag nagigising na lagyan mo ulit ng isa pang bolus or what i'm a fan of is gas anesthesia but of course that would require you to intubate your animal and if you think intubation is not done for large anim animals think again because it can be However, I will not be discussing it here because there's a lot of videos online that actually shows you how it is done. I will simply 
um, give you um, suggestions right there in the video as to those videos that you can check out to see the demonstrations of how to intubate large animals, right? And if you think the table about sedatives and pre-med drugs are too much already for doses, think again, all right? There's a different set of dosages for these uh, um, drug combinations pag dating sa general anesthesia. The first one that you saw there is just for sedation. All right. So, um, usually, if you gave an animal a pre-med already, like to calm them down or to to be able to um, put your IV catheter because sometimes it is uh, required or you need to sedate the animal for you to actually do anything to it, all right? Sometimes the doses for the GA would be decreased na, all right? But this one, this one would be for um, a patient that was not given a pre-med, right? So, um, where, where, I, I was gonna say something else. <laughs> I forgot, all right? Um, ketamine, if you look at the horses, ketamine is not, um, is a good anesthesia. Yes, it is widely used. When I asked my, um, professor in, uh, in anatomy <laughs> about horses, because he's an equine practitioner, um, he told me that there are three drugs that are used in horses. That would be silazine, diazepam, and ketamine which actually coincides with what i found in the book like alpha 2 agonist is the silazine ketamine and benzodiazepines all right so it's usually um what do you call this given in combination meaning magkakasama sila in one syringe or they are given um sequentially now it all depends now on the protocol of the of the clinic or of the of the farm or of the veterinarian but ketamine is not suitable alone for GA induction in horses because it can cause seizures. So um, this is essential to ensure that it is not accidentally given before the sedative. So it comes last, right? That's one thing that I think is important, right? If you're going to give alpha-2 agonists plus ketamine or uh, plus benzodiazepines, the ketamine comes last, right? So, um, what else? Usually, if you give a pre-medication, the right dose, in the right um, situation, the relaxation is good already. And a recovery from GA is smooth. That's why you want to pre-med before anesthetizing, number one. The amount of your general anesthesia would be much decreased. Number two, um, the recovery of your patient would not be so abrupt na um, it will be in so much pain and it will be howling or being so aggressive towards your personnel, all right? So um, what else? Calves, sheep, goats. Yes, you can see silas in there. You can see zolotil. Yes, it can can be used as well. Wala ang pigs because the pigs would have their own table <laughs> for induction of general anesthesia. Now, why are there so much um, drug combinations available for pigs. Remember, pigs are used for um, um, practice surgery by medical students. So there's a lot of things that are, a lot of studies done on pigs just to make sure that they could be um, anesthetized, you know, humanely and such. But I will be drawing your attention to this part of the table right here, right? As you can see, um, Zolotil, is mixed with alpha-2 agonist like silazine or detomidin and the um and the mm, doses are right there and as you can see all the route is im all right so i i just focused you on there because yan yung drug combination na meron sa pinas mahirap hanapin yung iba right if you can find it that's great like ace and then cat go for it silazine and cat go for it but i usually would steer away from ketamine Right. Now, how would we induce GA in horses, right? You have put your IV catheter, but why is it so important that you induce gas, uh, 
general anesthesia in horses in a certain way. Okay, right? let's watch this video. pause it right there this is what we call an induction box this is a well padded box all walls the door and the floor all right now uh, don't ask me about how they padded it it's just padded all right i've seen this in some uh clinics wherein they have cages that are well padded for those patients with neurological disease you know a uh, head tilt head uh head banging not head banging <laughs> head pressing um so they usually put them in a in a well padded box and this is what you need um for horses all right they're big ass horses weighing uh, a certain like sometimes half a ton all right so you have to make sure that when you induce anesthesia we're in all the limbs which is <laughs> suddenly go down you are doing it safely for the animal and for the personnel Now, in a lot of cases, uh, you only need one person who is very much experienced in um, uh, equine anesthesia. For some, um, this is also used as a training for uh, veterinary students to, um, for them to experience on how to handle horses. But as you can see, the horse would undergo severe incoordination or ataxia, um, just a wait a few minutes after induction of anesthesia IV and that uh, requires you to uh... properly sedated then they're given the induction drug for the induction of anesthesia there are several personnel this is for two reasons one is to make sure that the horse safely drops to the ground so we can put some gentle pressure against the horse's side so he can just fall against the wall the other reason for that is we want to protect the people inducing the anesthesia because the horses are big animals, sometimes weighing up to 1,800 to 2,000 pounds. The horse is in recumbency. Then we can place the endotracheal tube, which is a tube that goes through their mouth and into their trachea. Then the horse will be hoisted by its forelimbs and placed on the operating table. It's a very safe procedure to do, and it's done in our hospital over 5,000 times a year without incident. Once the horse is properly positioned on the operating table, we call this for it to be safe for the horse and all personnel. Now, if you have a lot of people, go ahead. You could help in uh, handling the horse as it goes down, right? 
um what else uh usually they would put um ropes around the horse would putting the horse in a chute help not really they would just bang on the they would just bang their head on to the we call this to the bars of the chute because they would suddenly be so recumbent and one important thing is that ideally if you don't have these mechanisms right if you don't have these mechanisms of transport of the animal from the anesthesia wing to the surgical wing ideally like in, in the field you anesthetize them where you're going to do the surgery kung wala kang ganitong uh, uh, transport devices for them right to make it easier for you don't anesthetize them on the far part of the farm only for for you to realize oh shit i need to transport it around a uh, hundred feet away all right because in the horse which weighs a lot of kilos that will be very hard to do especially if you are um if you're not ready or you don't have enough people right and um the physical handling ideally would be minimal which is similar to recovery um in horses you let them recover alone but they are they are guided with ropes na nakatay sa tail at nakatay sa nose area nila i think i, I think i have a video later right so I, also horses can sense anxiety and fear and will mimic uh, these behaviors right so that's it actually for in ga induction in horses is the same way for cattle but one thing that you have to be very careful with cattle is that um, what direction do cattle kick? Hmm. Horses, uh, horses kick the back, cow the leaf. How about cattle? To the side. Yes. So they can, they can, um, at to some extent, um, abduct their hind limbs, but only so much. The thing is, when they uh, when they um are anesthetized. They tend to become splayed, nagsis split monitor, right? Uh, one thing, pala, one important question: Why do we monitor? Because it's our job, doc. I'm the anesthetist. Why? Why do you need to monitor? Aside from making sure that they're alive. <laughs> what are you, you monitor? Heart rate, RR, temperature. If if you're lucky that sa inyo nakatapat yung machine you have a you have a pulse ox and um a bp if you're lucky you know what are these parameters indicative of what do they tell you hmm? yeah the heart's beating how good is it though yes there's a pulse what's the rate is it the same with the heart rate what are these parameters indicative of Starts with P. How good the oxygen is delivered throughout the body. That is what we call perfusion. And that is the goal of anesthesia. During anesthesia, we have to maintain the perfusion to all tissues um, once you have induced the animal until it recovers and can take care of itself. All right? So, um... The anesthetic monitoring for large animals entirely depends on what um, we're talking about GA here, huh? We're talking about general anesthesia. It all depends on what kind of um, institution you're in, right? If you're in an academic institution wherein they have a lot of uh, materials, <laughs> I guess we're not an academic institution because we don't have a lot of materials. <laughs> anyway, um, so man, when I, when I try to. So when I try to be a smart ass, na wala ako sa sa normal kong track of thought. Anyway, uh, it's the same with anesthetic monitoring. Of course, you monitor heart rate, respiratory rate, the temperature, which I'll be discussing in like two slides away. Right. So I'll will just be discussing um, the the idiosyncrasies or the different things pag the things sa large animals. All right. So, um, in pulse rate and quality, you must regularly palpate this. Usually, again, every five minutes. 
This provides information not just about the peripheral circulation, but also how good the cardiac contractility is. And um, for the horse, you have a lot of places to check this. Transverse facial artery, the facial artery, metacarpal, digital, you have four of those, and the metatarsal or dorsal pedal artery. All right. So the facial, the transverse facial, the dorsal pedal are also sites for catheter placement for um, in horses kasi. Okay. In horses kasi. Especially if you are in, a, in an equine surgical center. They are connected the same, the, uh, the anesthetic monitoring for horses are the same as humans. You connect them to an ECG. You connect um, an, an arterial catheter inside the artery to check for the arterial pressure. Yung ginagawa kasi nating BP, right? The, the blood pressure that we get, which is oscillometric, we put a cuff around the arm, it, you know, it constricts the arm, it measures the BP, and, and a rough estimation of the pulse, correct? But that is an indirect blood pressure monitor. The direct blood pressure monitor is you insert a catheter inside the artery of a patient, and you measure the arterial pressure inside. That is the direct measurement of BP. However, it is quite invasive. If you are not um, experienced in doing it, you are not. Um, you must not do it because puncturing an artery has its own risks as well. Pag puncturing a vein, may risk na, ba? Imagine the artery. So um, just imagine it, uh, all of it, uh, done for horses again. That is the ideal as well for dogs and cats, but we don't have the resources for it. All right, um, Doppler pulse monitors, the pulse oximeters that we have, yung clips that we put in the tongue, on the ear pinay, that is also um, applicable for them. Where do we usually um, place them in the horse? We can place them in the, uh, the ear pinay, the tongue, the nasal septum, and non-pigmented um, lips. Right, and they have very good. Um, yung distance between the lip and the gums is very big, so you could actually check the mucous membrane in there as well. So, what can make the pulse rate increase or decrease? What can make the pulse quality weak? A lot of things. Right, I don't know if you need to be um, reminded of that. <laughs> Do I need to? What increases the pulse rate? Number one. Your patient is waking up. <laughs> Number two, it would increase um, with the heart rate during the compensatory mechanism of shock. It would decrease if your if your anesthesia is too deep, if your shock has, has reached the decompensatory stage. Um, it will be weak if um, you administered a vasoconstrictive drug or, um, yeah, what will cause vasoconstriction? Your catecholamines, your alpha two agonists. Um, that's the only thing that I remember <laughs> that could cause vasoconstriction. All right. So there's a lot of things. So you have to take. Uh, you have to be very careful when you give drugs because they might have their own cardiovascular uh, effects, which, if you're not aware of, you might be surprised when you experience it in the um, surgery. All right. There's a difference with eye position and movement with these animals. Um, usually in cattle, they would be dramatically displaced ventral to ventral medial direction. Um, yes, all you see is the sclera most of the time. With the sheep, goats, and pigs though, they will displace ventrally as well, but not as much as cattle. Right? Imagine them like doing an eye roll. The cattle would be the mean girl here. Right? Horses, though, imagine them. Again, horses are like people. The eyes are closed with the eyeball just slightly rotated ventral me uh, medially to, um, to that direction. And you could see just a small triangle of sclera on the tip or on the lateral canthus of the eye. Right? Um, it's bad when um, you see that the eye is in the center because that means your anesthesia is too deep. And if the horse's palpebrae are open, that's a bad thing, right? And uh, what else? Oh, movement, eye movement. Nystagmus can be seen during light anesthesia in horses and after cardiac arrest. 
So that makes it quite complicated because when you see nystagmus, you don't know if it's actually waking up or it's actually died. It has actually died. So again, it doesn't mean na kapag may nystagmus, either nagigising na siya or mamatay na siya. Right? You have to um, correlate this with the other anesthetic monitoring parameters that we have discussed. Right? This is a picture of a cattle. See how much of the sclera is in there? Wala na yung cornea. That is normal. Right? Don't be freaked out. It's not dead. That's just how they are. Right? One important thing about temperature of your animals. Right? Malignant hyperthermia. I don't know who among you are actually into medical dramas. This is the fifth question I'm making. Oh gosh, I have a lot of questions, huh? Anyway, what may, uh, why are my questions important for you? Number one, I could simply decide that your exams would just be about the questions I ask and not about any PDF that I post, All right? And there are a lot of things that I have withheld from discussing just to give you an opportunity to ask yourself, <laughs> okay? So, um, I cannot assess you either way. Exams are easily cheated upon. I roll. Insert I roll in there. So, uh, try to research because if you have time to watch this, you also have time to research, right? If you have time to do a lot of things online, hmm, um, then maybe uh, dedicate just a few minutes of Googling something that would actually make you smarter, right? So, malignant hyperthermia, a very common, not really common, um, a very, uh, I won't say common because it's not really, the statistics are not high, but it's very known syndrome. It's a clinical genetic syndrome which affects various species, includes dogs, cats, horses, pigs, and man. However, the most affected would be pigs and man, right? This is a uh, genetic syndrome. This is because of mutation. Your assignment is where, all right? What is the mutation that causes malignant hyperthermia? And when I say it's genetic, yes, it can be passed through generations, right? This is triggered by stress, exercise, and halogenated inhalation anesthetics. What are the halogenated inhalation anesthetics? And we use that for gas anesthesia. Isoflurane, best, number one, cheapest too. What else? Sevoflurane, desflurane, halothane, with halothane as the most uh, potent one, right? So this may um, happen in various animal species. Again, it can more commonly happens in pigs. That's why I inserted this here. We're in um, this condition has its own name in swine. It's porcine stress syndrome and uh, in humans as well. What happens here, right? When this, um, this condition is triggered, this causes a sudden and dramatic rise in the body temperature. So your body um, gets into this hypermetabolic state. Everything just, um, cell usage, sorry, uh, ATP usage is high. There is a high body temperature, high heart rate, high RR. And with that, there is also development of cardiac arrhythmias. The muscles would, would suddenly contract and relax in different parts of the body. They would eventually be rigid, right? And a severe area, severe cases were in the problem were not was not resolved during the first part of recognition. Usually, would be the metabolic acidosis, renal failure, and uh, death. Right? So you have to be very careful when you're monitoring these um, animals because you don't know if they have this, um, this problem, this genetic syndrome, until they show signs during, um, uh, during surgery. Now, why would they be triggered by surgery? Number one, the stress during pre-op, during handling, uh, when you're placing your IV catheter, when you're inducing them with anesthetics. Number two, if you expose them to those inhalation anesthetics, sevo, isoflurane. And honestly, those uh, inhalation anesthetics are very safe. And that's the problem with malignant hyperthermia. You don't know if they have malignant hyperthermia unless they have it in the family. 
you have a known history of this um this condition manifesting itself within the family so there are some breeds that are affected more by the syndrome especially those heavily muscled show pigs poland china petrin landrace large white hampshire then some breeds are less susceptible and that includes the duroc all right so big question is how do you manage a malignant hyperthermia episode in your patient imagine if this, this is a pig right temperature just suddenly goes up that fast right how do you manage it that's that's the question for you right oh i didn't enter it that is the question right and again i will list all these questions in the google classroom for you guys all right next what are the complications of anesthesia specifically general anesthesia number one would be regurgitation right again it can happen in all species but is much more profuse in ruminants right and this can lead easily to aspiration and impaired gas exchange so how do we prevent this of course appropriate fasting proper patient positioning and if you can intubate right just make sure that you properly inflate the cuff and you remove the endotracheal tube properly um, during recovery. How do you know when to remove the endotracheal tube when the patient has restored its gag reflex already and it is actively showing the tube, right? Number two uh, for ruminants would be a rumen tympani, right? Or bloat, if you want to be a layman about it, right? The ways to prevent, again, proper positioning. Um, a lot of positions could render this uh, possible. Uh, number one would be uh, dorsal recumbency or any recumbent position. However, lateral and sternal. Sternal would be the best way if you're going to do, um, call this uh, surgery rec in recumbency position. And how do you prevent this? For example, you need to do a midline ciliotomy. Um, you're going to do um, a radical surgery of the other or the teeth. You, you don't have any way but to place the animal in dorsal recumbency, right? What you can do is to um, pass an orogastric tube before the start of surgery so that the passageway for the air is kept patent, right? Uh, ways to treat if this if the animal develops this during surgery you can decompress the stomach percutaneously with a trocar and cannula or if possible you can pass an orogastric tube during surgery right and when all else fails when you think again bloat can lead to further um, cardiovascular effects because there is decreased uh, venous return to the heart um, you can abandon GA and position the animal in sternal recumbency and uh, wait for eructation to, um, to happen. And this will happen as they recover. Another complication would be bradycardia or decreased heart rate. And this is entirely dependent on the underlying cause as to how you will fix it. Right? This can be an anesthetic depth problem. If it is under gas in um, anesthesia, you could decrease the percentage of the inhalation and you administer 100% oxygen. Um, hyperkalemia can also lead to bradycardia. When you manipulate the viscera, that can also lead to reflex bradycardia, same way as uh, the oculocardiac reflex happens. Remember your, your uh, oculocardiac reflex? Uh, surgery two people last time? When you manipulate the eye or parts of the eye, including the ocular muscles, that actually sends a signal to the heart to beat um, much slower, right? And how do you fix it? Of course, atropine is there at that dose, right? Another common complication of anesthesia, not just in large animals, would be hypoventilation and hypoxemia. Um, just... It's just more significant in ruminants because they have that big abdominal content that could impede the diaphragmatic movement during respiration. 
and the uh, these abdominal contents can also displace the di the diaphragm cranially, um, which <clears throat> takes up a big space of the thoracic cavity. Right. Also, there's this uh, mechanism which you learned in Fisher too, hopefully, uh, which is ventilation perfusion mismatching. Right. Um, this is where um, the amount of air. Ideally, ideally, okay. Ideally, the amount of air that goes into the lung, right and left, must be equal to the amount of blood entering the lung. All right. So there is, uh, you know, uh, a match between every oxygen molecule and every, um, they call this, uh, hemoglobin that is waiting in the alveoli to be exchanged. All right. So lagi yan dapat pantay. Basically, I'm not going to go into the partial pressures discussion. If you need me to, just let me know if you need a reminding of that. Um, but basically, if there is a mismatch, meaning if the, um, the amount of air going in is impeded or the amount of blood going into the lungs are impeded in cases wherein you have, uh, um, what do you call this, mechanical compression, of the lung kapag na push ng abdominal contents in diaphragm cranially that takes up thoracic tissue space which is involved in oxygen carbon dioxide exchange and when that doesn't happen there is a mismatch between the ventilation and perfusion you might have more air that is in there that is supposed to oxygenate the blood but there is not much blood um, entering the lungs to be perfused right so bumabalik yung non-oxygenated blood into the um, into the animal's body and into the circulation which could cause which could cause a very big problem right and also what is the difference between hypoventilation and hypoxemia this is a patho i guess what do you expect i i i, I expect you to um <laughs> Uh, to we call this correlate all these subjects together because that's how you become a doctor. Okay. Hypoventilation. The, the main difference between the two is that ventilation refers to carbon dioxide and hypoxemia refers to oxygen. Right? So hypoventilation, as a review, is uh, basically the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, which always needs to be greater than 45 millimeter mercury. Do you remember your partial pressures? <laughs> and hypoxemia would now refer to the partial pressure of oxygen, which should never be less than 80 millimeter mercury. Okay, Fisher 2, review that. Such a fun thing, pulmonary physiology. So how do you prevent this again? Fasting, positioning, and endotracheal intubation. All right, so... That is it for the first part of anesthesia in large animals. In the next video, we will be discussing regional and local anesthesia. Thank you for listening. Have a good day.